Welcome to the Eye on Annapolis Local Business Spotlight. There are thousands of locally owned businesses in the area, some small and some large. Some you may know and others you don't. But one thing they all have in common is a great story, and we want to share it with you. Join us every Saturday as we talk to the founders, the owners, and the managers of local businesses you have come to know and love, and those you will come to know and love. Now here's your host, John Frenet, with this week's Local Business Spotlight. All right, well, we're rolling up here to Crofton again, and we're sitting down with James King, who is the CEO of Titan Hospitality, which many people probably don't know what that is, but we'll say it's the Black Wall Hitch. We'll talk the uh, Smashing Grapes. We've got the expansion that's coming down, and also you've got uh, Black Wall Barn and Lodge and a new thing coming to Annapolis called The Lodge. Yes. So I think the last time we caught up was in the middle of COVID, yeah. And I got to say that you sort of were able to see the future there with that. And I know everybody is, uh, consumers anyhow, are somewhat squawking about different fees and stuff like that. I know sure. we talked about possibly reclaiming some of the credit card fees and, mm-hmm. and everything else. And, you know, it's it's pretty much a thing now. And yeah. I, we're all starting to get used to it. I mean, as sad as it may be. Unfortunately, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's... Um you know, coming out of COVID, we really saw um, a couple things. One, the inflation with prices, uh, with our product coming through the back door, just through the roof. We are um, con- continuing to see that with all of our products, whether it's food, plastics, paper, even kitchen equipment. You know, we're just seeing a 30% increase from uh, if you were to buy an oven three months before COVID hit. And today it's 30 to 40% more. That's crazy. Um, As we're building our new restaurants um, right now, what was a four to five million dollar total project cost from a ground up restaurant is now seven and a half million dollars. So it's it's impacted the industry incredibly. The credit card fees, um, unfortunately, you know, the credit card companies have very, um, I guess, they've really they, figured a way to take three to five percent off your bottom line. Every small business in the in the country, right? They've come in and basically taken three to five percent of every small business and big business in America, and so um, those fees have become unsustainable for a lot of the small businesses. You just can't, you know, they add up to seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, and so. Yeah, we made a conscious decision. We talked about it. We put a lot of thought into it. A lot of restaurants just raised their prices and said, hey, we've got to absorb these fees. We're going to raise prices. I understand that. I felt it was more honest and transparent to our consumer to actually put it on the menu, explain it, and not penalize a customer paying cash for a fee they're not paying. So if I just raise the burger a buck, I'm penalizing somebody who's coming in paying cash. Right. And so we felt it was more transparent and honest to say, hey, look, this is what the fee is. This is why we're charging it. And we're only going to charge it for those who are in in making us incur the fee, basically. And as a a consumer, I do personally appreciate that. I know there are some restaurants. There's uh, one goes unnamed at this point, but I put something called like a love and happiness fee. Mm -hmm. And uh, they automatically add it on. And it says visit our website to find out what it is. And it goes on. It says it's to help to pay the back end of the end of the. And I'm like, well, that's kind of, you know, it's a lot and, of work to figure out what you're well, well, it is. And even if I know who it is, then it and they said you can take it off. Just ask your server. Yeah. But I'm like, now I'm looking at my server saying, you know, I don't want you to have like vacation. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know? right. I mean, how horrible well, is that? And, you know, I'd like to remind the consumer from time to time when, when, when we have discussions with them about the fee is that, you know, typically the consumer using that credit card is getting gas points or getting rewards, miles, airline miles, right. all these things. Why, as a small business owner, should I pay for you to go to vacation next month for using your credit card? Right? Those are rewards. Personally, you I don't have, have a problem with that. If you just want to cut me a check a little right. later I mean, on today, I'll, I'll be glad I, to get out of town Most next people month. like that. But it's, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a changing time. And, and the same person said, well, I'll, be, I'll just go to the ATM. And I said, okay, what's the ATM going to charge you to take right, 50 right. bucks? It's going to be three, three bucks, bucks, to three bucks anyway. Yeah. So it, it just becomes a reality of the money markets that we live in today. And those fees, unfortunately, always get passed on to the end user. Yeah, well, it is unfortunate, but let's let's get into it. I mean, you have you grew up last time we talked. I know you said that you pretty much grew up in the restaurant from yeah. the uh, sweeping the floors to taking the trash out to the kitchen and all the way up to where we are today. And, you know, as I sort of look through what you've done, you have had experience everywhere. You've franchised with mm-hmm. the Green Turtle. You've had. I'm going to screw it up. Is it Roy Rogers? Roy Rogers. Okay. Yeah, Roy Rogers. It was one of the roast beef places. Yeah. I know you've got the uh, black wall hitches in mm-hmm. Alexandria here. And in, as well as Annapolis, mm-hmm. uh, black wall barn and lodge, which now exists, which you used to own it when it was Kaufman's, I believe. Yep. That's right. And then uh, for a hot minute there, it was Jay King's. Yep. 
Uh, and now you've got Smashing Grapes, which is up here in Gambrels, most recently closed down in Annapolis, which sort of took everybody by surprise. Yeah. And that's going to be replaced by uh, not something dis too dissimilar from what you have, but it's going to be called The Lodge. So we're very excited about this project. So when we, uh, during COVID, we um, came to our end of our franchise agreements with the Green Turtle and we created the Smashing Grapes brand. And we did the Watch Apple Gambrels location as well as downtown Annapolis or by the mall in Annapolis. And we saw very two very different paths with, with the sales of that. The Gambrels location does phenomenally well. It's been busy from day one. Um, and we're thrilled to death with the volume. Annapolis was a much slower start, you know, whether it's the location, whether it's by the mall, you know, who knows traffic patterns. When you build a restaurant, you do a ton of demographic research and, and you just never really know what's going to hit and what's not going to hit. Um, what we started to realize was that while it was successful and it, it was, it was a challenging decision to make because when we looked at our uh, online reviews on open table and Yelp, we had some of the best five-star reviews out of that location. The service was good. The food was good. Everyone seemed to enjoy it. Um, but we just weren't seeing the sales that we wanted to see or that we really needed to see to pay the rent and the landlord and the bank note and all that good stuff. So we spent a couple months really looking at it and, you know, we contemplated tweaking the business model and running promotions and specials and things like that. But I think what we really came down to the conclusion was that we we, we kind of overshot the market. And, you know, it's a high-end brand. There's 360 bottles of wine on the wine list. There's Ahi Tuna. You know, the average check price is a little expensive. And that seems to work in a bedroom community like Crofton and Gambrels in Annapolis next to the mall, next to a lot of chain restaurants and Red Lobster and things like that. I think what we found was people who were going out for a high-end experience and an anniversary dinner or a special occasion weren't really thinking about going to the mall for that experience. There's a lot of opportunities to do that in downtown Annapolis and Eastport and those areas. And so what we decided was let's put a much more approachable brand there. Um, Smashing Grapes, again, is it's a high-end brand. It's couples, it's celebrations, it's events. Um, the Lodge, um, similar to our Blackwell Barn and Lodge in Gambrels, is a much more um, approachable, affordable, kind of down-to-earth, blue-collar brand. We see a lot of families and kids in there. And we just felt that would be a better fit for the Annapolis Mall area that had other chain restaurants. There's a Cracker Barrel coming in right in front of us in, in the coming months. And so that'll bring probably a thousand cars a week into the parking lot. So we're excited right. about that volume. I don't really com consider them competition, <laughs> um, but Hey, it's great to bring volume to the restaurant park. Um, and so what we're really excited about doing is taking our barn and lodge concept in Gambrels minus the barn. And if you've been there, basically taking a restaurant, the concept of the restaurant, the outdoor patio, some private event rooms, and putting that in, in that area. And we think it's going to be a much more uh, appealing brand to a larger swath of the population. Well, what you say is is dead on as far as I'm concerned. As far as if I want to go out for a special dinner, and granted, I can totally get it as smashing grapes. I sure. mean, the food, food is wonderful and everything else. But, you know, I'm not sitting there thinking like, okay, so how do I get there? Okay, well, you come off of Route 50. You right, hang right, you right. hang it right at the Red Lobster. Yep. Uh, yep. Just go past the Cracker Barrel. <laughs> right. And then there we are in the corner, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, by the, the Mexican joint, and we're, we're, we're there between right. the hotel. I, I get that. Yeah. And that probably makes a lot of sense. And Annapolis is a weird little town anyhow as far as what does and doesn't fly. Yeah. And there's a lot of competition for high end restaurants. I frequent them all the time with my wife and we love to go down there and there's, there's no shortage of getting, uh, finding a nice restaurant, whether it's a nice steakhouse or an Italian restaurant or something like that. Um, but what I do think there is a shortage of is that kind of farm to table, approachable, rustic, elegant concept that has been such a success in gambles. I mean, we did $8.2 million in sales last year in our gambles locations on a sleepy little road you know, in a residential area. And we just feel like taking that and putting that in a much more populated area with the better demographics. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to take the barn that seats 200 and do the big private events. But what we will have is an outdoor patio that will screen in and make four seasons that can hold 75 to 80 people and three private dining rooms inside, one that'll hold 45, and then two smaller ones that'll hold 12 to 14 or 16 to 18. So we can still capture private events. We can do the smaller gatherings, the little birthday parties, rehearsal and, dinners, and, and things I've like got, that. And when I've got the 200-party thing, you've got the Blackwell Barn and Lodge just up the road. Just up the it's, road. It's an easy cross-sell. And a couple to, of hotels in Annapolis who have the big ballroom. So we're not, you know, in Gambles, you don't really have that. In Annapolis, there are opportunities to have larger events at some of the hotels and the ballrooms and things like that. So we're 
not really going to compete for those bigger events, um, but we think we'll be very competitive for the smaller events. Fantastic. Well, what have you started construction on it yet? And is it going to change very much from where the way to- it, it is? So we're we're starting with all the things that we don't need a permit for. So paint. Uh, wallpaper. <laughs> you obviously uh, know how the county uh, government works. Hardwood <laughs> flooring, right? So we are in for permit, or we will be in for permit this week. We're actually structurally not not proposing a whole lot. We are going to build the private dining rooms that I just spoke about. So we'll break the inside space up. We are going to put some fireplaces in, um, but a lot of the work is going to be finishes. So paint, wallpaper, hardwood floors being refinished and redone. A tremendous amount of stone, which fits our brand. So a lot of stone work on the walls on our outdoor patios, uh, all new lighting and chandeliers and things of that nature, some glass partitions, uh, some lounge furniture. So when you walk into the restaurant, um, you'll be able to go off to the right-hand side, which has the big bar. We're changing the granite bar tops and the lighting over the bar and the back bar. Um, And then we'll have a nice loungy couch area, so a lot of leather seating in front of the fireplace, very warm and cozy, um, as well as some high-top tables and all brand-new bar stools. Um, And then you'll transition into the restaurant side, um, which will have a main dining room in the center and then two private dining rooms off to the sides, as well as the private dining room that already exists now um, that holds about 45. We'll change the entrance to that, uh, and we're going to make that room very special with carpet and fireplaces and stonework oh. and, and millwork. And so nice. um, we're also going to refinish the patios. So we'll be doing both outdoor patios there. We're changing the awnings. We're changing the signage. We're painting the exterior of the building. So we're, we've budgeted about $1.2 million for the renovation. So we're putting significant resources into it. We're hoping to do it all in 90 days. Again, the county and permitting is the, is the <laughs> question mark, right? About half of the work or 75% of the work I just mentioned, you don't need a permit for. So we're getting our guys started right away on that. Uh, and then we'll kind of be in a little bit of a waiting process to get the uh, appropriate permit from the county to build the private rooms and put the fireplace in and working with the liquor board. And, and my hope is to be open in mid-October. Okay. So I think we can get the holiday season in, which is very exciting. Fantastic. Well, we're going to have to make sure we get in there to get a sneak peek before it is, it is all done there. But you guys have not resting on your laurels, if yeah. you will. Uh, I mean, Smashing Grapes continues on in Gambrels, and that's mm-hmm. just 10 minutes up the road from here. It took me sure. 20 minutes to get here. It's no big deal to get there from Annapolis yeah. uh, if you're a fan of Smashing Grapes. But that is also moving out into Columbia, down into the Merriweather uh, it is. district. We are. So it's busy times for us. We've got uh, basically three new projects on our plate right now. We're negotiating a fourth. So we've got um, the lodge we just spoke about, which is uh, going to be opening here hopefully in October. Uh, and then next on the timeline, and probably before that, quite frankly, is we're just about two to three weeks away from opening our Blackwell Barn and Lodge in, in Columbia in the Merriweather uh, Entertainment District. So we started that construction process seven months ago. It's 12,000 square feet, and we are in the final home stretch now. We're actually calling in final inspections for the end of August. Uh, we hope to be 100% with construction by second week of September signed off with inspection, start training, and have the doors open by the end of September. So we're about a month there, um, and we just went in for permit um, in Howard County. We wrapped up all of our architectural drawings, and we are in for permit for the Smashing Grapes in Columbia, which will be directly across the street from the Barn and Lodge uh, in the same entertainment district. And that is slated to open in February. Um, so we've got kind of three back-to-back-to-back openings coming in the next six months. And then we have just negotiated a deal, and we're close to finalizing um, for the Rotunda in Baltimore. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that area, but it's kind of a over by Roland Park and uh, Gilman and those okay, areas, right. kind of north Baltimore, close to the county line. Um, and we're negotiating to put a Blackwell Barn and Lodge there. There's a very cool and unique uh, building called the power plant that sits in the middle of that entire development. And the building's been empty for, I think, 30 years. And it's got some incredible architectural features and skylights and old brick and columns. And uh, we're, we're really excited to get our architectural team to get their hands around that and create this really unique, cool barn and lodge. See there. what they can so, do, what they can do there. Yeah. Which is easier, Anne Arundel or Howard County? Oh, it's a tough one. Um, I would. Uh, I, I hate throw to under the bus, uh, or Calvin. <laughs> you know, I hate to say it, but uh, and because because Anne Arundel County is my home county, but but Howard County is probably a little bit quicker in there in right, turning things right. around. Well, the Merriweather District is really just exploding. I mean, you've got busboys and poets. You've got just some wonderful, you know, restaurants. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you're going from. Arguably, probably you're going into a lot more competition. Sure, um, but you're obviously bringing a different type of. Uh, 
We are. And actually, you'd be surprised on the competition. We feel that the Howard County market, um, and specifically Columbia, is really underserved by restaurants. And we hear that constantly. We've been hearing it for years. And we talk to a lot of our people and a lot of our investors, actually, who, who either work over there or, or, or live over there, feel there's just not enough restaurants in that area for the population. And nothing like the Barn and Lodge, which will be completely unique, no event, private event space uh, of our size. So we do think we have a unique niche in the market, but we also believe, you know, just being steps from Meriwether Post Pavilion, where there's concerts every weekend for five months out of the year, is going to be a huge boom to us. And, uh, and we're really excited to be part of the community. We have a captive audience of residents above us, We've got office buildings next to us. The Howard County Library is being redeveloped and built there. There's two hotels coming. So a lot of development going on over there and really going to be a booming place. It really, it really has boomed. I mean, it's, and it's drawing consistently from, you know, Ellicott City, probably. Uh, yeah. Is that Western Baltimore or sort whatever? Of, you know, the Fulton area and yeah. all those places kind of get sucked into coming down to Columbia to eat dinner. That's it. And Meriwether is, is just a boon for you as well. I, no I'd question. imagine there. And I mean, one of my other questions I had was the, uh, with the Black Wall Barn and Lodge expansion. So you've got one coming up in Baltimore. Anything more with Black Wall Hitch? So we're always looking. Um, we, we, I see that on your website. And, and again, the main website is actually uh, titanhospitality.com. But uh, I'll put all the other ones in the show notes. But yeah. it always says got a location or something. Along yeah. Yeah. So we, um, we look at our, our growth trajectory in phases. Uh, we're in our third growth phase. We try to be well thought out and, and really do it in a manner where we're not growing too fast for the infrastructure. And so what we do, uh, as we, as we enter into these growth phases is we grow our infrastructure first. We've kind of learned the, the lessons the hard way when you grow too fast, too quick, and don't have the right people. So prior to any growth phase for us, we add uh, oversight in our culinary teams, oversight in our operations teams, our beverage director gets support, our accounting office, our marketing team, our human resources. We truly try to build out enough support and infrastructure to handle the growth. So we've done that. And now it's the task of opening the restaurants and staffing them. We've hired all of our management uh, team for Black Wall Barn and Lodge in Columbia. They've been training in our Gambrels location. So we've kind of get them in a couple months before we open, teach them the ropes, get them trained up. Uh, we've hired 64 employees for that location. We're trying to get to 80, so we're getting close there. But then we'll take a deep breath and we'll make sure our existing restaurants are running efficiently and running well, make sure they're all staffed properly, and then kind of do it all over again. And we work with uh, a great local commercial realtor, John Rosso, who's been with us for probably a decade now. And his work really never ends. We consistently have him out in the field putting opportunities in front of us. They don't all work out and some you negotiate for months and you can't get to lease sure. terms and others just the size isn't right or the traffic counts aren't right. But with that's a, really a never ending process for us where I probably visit uh, two to three sites a month. Um, to just to look at them and walk the sites and look at the traffic patterns and see the competition. And we're fortunate enough to kind of pick and choose and wait for the right deal to come along and get the right economic terms. And then there's always the lease negotiation with the landlord. But our goal is two new projects a year for the next three to five years. And that will hopefully put us on a trajectory to about 70 million in revenue with uh, seven to 800 employees. Um, and then I guess we'll, you know, sleep for a little bit, take a deep breath and, and, and recoup and figure it out from there. But now that's your expansion, the are you looking to keep it within those three brands that you, that you have for the most part? We are. So what we feel like we've done is created, and, and you and I talked a little bit before the show about this, but you know, we've created three distinct brands. The Blackwall Hitch is our waterfront nautical urban brand. The Blackwall Barn and Lodge is our more rustic rural brand. And then the Smash and Grace brands are more suburban brand where we think we can go into town centers and strip malls and things of that nature where maybe there's too much fast food and chain restaurant and provide that upscale independent restaurant. And so what we've tried to do is create three unique concepts that regardless of what the location may be that we're looking at, we have a concept that will fit there. Um, And so it's really helped us with our expansion and growth plans to be able to Really, no location is off the table because we think one of our brands fits pretty much anywhere, whether it's downtown, urban, suburban, or more rural. Makes sense. Makes sense. You had mentioned about your different teams that are working together to make sure that you maintain your teams to keep your growth in line with your growth. And I mean, okay, let's just say your marketing team, obviously, they can handle all three brands and, sure. and that's fine. 
Uh, what about your like your management teams for your brands? Do you have individual teams like that? This is the Blackwall Hitch Kitchen Crew. Yeah, they're, they're so, designing the things. I mean, or is there one master titan? So both to answer that question. So we have a corporate oversight team with a chief operating officer who handles the front of the house operations. And then we have a culinary director uh, as well as a corporate chef. They're responsible for the entire operation. Below that tier, we also have specific unit managers and district managers. So we have one individual whose sole responsibility is to oversee our Blackwall hitches. We have one who strictly does our Blackwall barn and lodges. And we have another district manager who strictly does our smashing grapes brands. So we've kind of have it set up in a tiered level where we do have complete oversight for the whole company. But below that, we have specific individuals and all they do is focus on specific brands. Curious, curious with your different brands in different locations. Okay, you've got a Blackwall Hitch in Alexandria. You've got one in Annapolis. The market's similar, but could be different. Yeah. Does the Blackwall Hitch Alexandria have the exact same menu as the Annapolis one, or does the manager there have and the the chef there have the ability to tweak as needed? Or? So identical main menus. The differences are the wine list and signature cocktails, and that's predominantly due to the different liquor laws that we have and sourcing of products. So there are certain wines, for instance, that in Virginia we can't get can't that get. we can get in Maryland. Um, so their wine list differs, their signature cocktails differ. But from a food perspective, their menus are the same. That's actually one of the um, things that I enjoy most about my job and that I think our culinary teams do is our kind of process that we go through for our menu development. And it really is a collaboration. I'm a strong believer in positive workplace culture and bringing people together and and giving them a, a seat at the table. And so twice a year, we change the menu at every brand. We do a fall winter menu and we do a spring summer menu. And the process for that is really fun. And we bring all the chefs together. So regardless of the brand or concept you work at, you're invited to these tastings. And I, I typically start that process with an email to all 26 or 28 of our culinary guys in the, in the company saying, hey, we're going into the fall winter menu at uh, Blackwell Barn and Lodge. Here are the seven seasonal items that we're going to take off that are more spring, summer. We need to replace them with fall, winter items. And so maybe there's two salads, a soup, two entrees, and an appetizer. And the culinary team knows exactly what's coming off. And then they start creating dishes and we do tastings where literally all 25 people are in the kitchen making different six appetizers, seven soups. And we just taste it all together. Guys go onto the barn and lodge going, this sucks. (laughs) Absolutely. There's a lot of friendly competition there. And and what I found it does, John, is it's buy-in from my team. There's not a menu that I have that doesn't have... 12 or 14 of my culinary guys who have items on that menu that they created from scratch, they put in front of us, they put their blood, sweat, and tears into it. And so now they feel like they're a part of it. Well, they right? It's it, their yeah. menu. It's their menu items. And and I, uh, I'm i a firm believer in tapping into as much talent as I possibly can, taste as many things from as many different sources as possible. They all come to the table with different backgrounds and different ethnicities and different, you know, growing up as kids, eating different foods in different regions of the country. And so it's really fun to put all that together. It's not good for my weight, but it it, it definitely is fun to eat 50 <laughs> things and try them all. And, and it's a lot of fun. You know, so. I, 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 running a restaurant has to be next to impossible, much less running so many that, that you do have. And I know, I remember during COVID, I talked to Alex Smith and, uh, you know, he had said with, with Atlas had said, every time they open and close me, and then you were fighting that fight yeah. with the open and close said, it's 30,000 bucks. And, and just without, I just might yeah. as well write that check, Yep, which is bizarre to me that yep. you sit there and you, you just think that that is, I mean, there's just so many different risks. I talked to, you know, Bill Mulhauser one time at Rams who had said, you know, talk about the stress of, okay, I'm booking bands 304 nights a, a year. Uh, they don't all do good. <laughs> they don't all show up, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, so, so I, I mean, it's, it's gotta be an, an incredible, uh, you know, a bit of stress and, uh, it, it is. It's, it. it's undoubtedly one of the hardest industries to be successful. And I'm sure you know, and everyone knows the statistics, nine out of 10 restaurants close right in the first three years. And so you have to have a passion for it. You have to have experience. You have to be able to multitask. You have to be able to handle stress extremely well. But more importantly, you have to be able to to think quick on your feet and, and navigate and change and pivot each day. There are um, it's a new world post COVID. There are challenges that I never thought I would ever see in this industry. There's new challenges. 
I tell people all the time, I've never worked harder in my entire life. And I've been in the business 35 years. My days have gotten longer. The weeks have gotten longer. The, the, the tasks on my plate have gotten longer. But there's more and more challenges than we dealt with prior to COVID, especially as you talk monetarily and financially with, with inflation and labor costs and trying to identify and find labor. We're 20% short-staffed across the company still. Um, we're hiring constantly, trying to find good people. Our wages have gone. The average line cook prior to COVID was in the twelve to thirteen dollars an hour range. Now they're eighteen to nineteen dollars an hour. So we've seen a thirty five percent increase in our labor costs. We've seen a thirty percent increase in our cost of goods sold. Our electric bills have gone up. Yeah. Our rent. I mean, it's just and so I get very nervous that there's a breaking point for the general public. I mean, at what point? You know, how much can I charge for a burger to make my food costs right? Before COVID, it was thirteen bucks. Now it's eighteen bucks. Where will it be in six months? Will it be twenty one dollars? And at what point does the middle class family say, "No, yeah. we just can't do it. We just can't buy a twenty three dollar hamburger on a Tuesday night." And so, we have seen our sales steadily increase coming out of COVID every month for the last two and a half years until June of this year. We saw a leveling off, kind of an evening out, and now we're seeing a very slight decline. So I feel like we're kind of over the peak. We're coming back down, and now the big question everyone is Where's asking is: Is it going to be a steep fall off? Is it going to be a slow decline and then level? I personally believe we're headed for an economic slowdown. I don't think we're heading for a recession, but I, I do think we're heading for an economic slowdown. Uh, and I think our industry is always the first to be impacted by that because well, it's it expendable makes income. It makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, regardless of whether I'm eating at McDonald's or whether I'm eating at Smashing Grapes, uh, that's my discretionary income. Sure. Absolutely. That, that's for sure. Yeah. You yourself, you're getting ready to go out to lunch or dinner today. Which one of your brands are you going to? Which is your favorite? So, you know, it's funny. I I, uh, I hit them all. I, I think the Barn and Lodge in Gambrels has a special place in my heart because it was the first restaurant that I built from scratch from the ground up. We tore it down to the ground. We started with a clean palate. And I had my hand in the design of every square inch and corner of that building, whereas a lot of our other restaurants we inherited a building and we converted mm-hmm. it and i was kind of stuck with the way it was so there'll always be a, a special place in my heart for that uh, that being said i love them all and now as we we grow new restaurants that i am building from scratch those places will obviously have a special heart but uh you know i i, I grew up not too far from here i live here now it's the closest restaurant to my home so you know, Barn and Lodge is where I spend a little bit more time than probably my other units. Okay, fair enough. Well, when we're done here, you're going to have to give me a map on how to get out of there because I've left Barn and Lodge probably <laughs> half a dozen times and I have, next thing I know, I'm like around, 97 yeah. North. I'm like, where the hell am I yeah, going? got to know where you're going to get there and, and get um, out. Well, question for you. I mean, you had the Green Turtle franchises. Why did we move out of a franchise thing? It's a great question. So let me start by saying we have a great relationship with those guys and, and they were fun to work with and our our investments were successful. But at the end of the day, you know, we, most individuals uh, buy into a franchise because they need marketing support, they need developmental support, they need construction support, uh, they need operational support. uh, And a franchise offers all that to you at a fee that you pay for every month. You know, we were at a point in our careers in, in the company's growth where we had our own architects, we had our own builders, we had our own construction teams, we have our own finance teams, our own CPAs, our own marketing teams. And so to pay a, a franchise company 5% a month of revenue, not profits of revenue, regardless right, of whether right. you're, you're successful or not. or not, to do what we naturally could do on our own and not have full control of the business. Um you know, there was a lot of arguments between the franchisees and the franchisor about where we felt quality of food was going at the brand, where we felt the marketing was going. When I bought into the franchise, you couldn't turn the TV on without seeing a green turtle ad. Um, and that kind of disappeared. And so you're kind of asking, hey, where are, my, where are my dollars going here? And that's not to say they were doing anything untoward, but they had a different vision of how to grow the company and where to put the dollars in and where to grow. And so we had 10 year franchise agreements. We were coming to the end of those when COVID hit and we just decided, you know what, it's time for us to grow our independent independent side of the company faster and, and make that the focus of our growth as opposed to the franchise world where you don't really control everything. Well, one thing that you did mention too, is that you're, you're buying into the marketing and the, and the support that the franchises. And I know that we've talked to a lot of small businesses that are franchises, actually just one of your neighbors up here that played against sports. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Antoine was saying that, you know, I mean, most people don't realize, I mean, he's a local guy, lives, you know, his kids go to school here, he's hiring local people. It's 
you know, he's contributing to the baseball teams and stuff like that. And with the franchise, I mean, a lot of that is the marketing. Okay. Yeah. People know who the green turtle is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a good portion of your percentage that you're paying every month is go to have that green sign sure. with that little turtle and everything else. But obviously now that you've turned around and, you know, from the, the construction aspect of it, I mean, the, the nuts and bolts of it, you figured out how to do that on your own. And over those years, you've been able to build that brand on your own, both sure. the Blackwall Hitch, the Blackwall Barn and Large, as well as the uh, Smashing Grapes as well. Yeah, so the, and, and, and the branding piece is the hard part because um, at the end of the day, you always want, you know, when, when you're deciding to go out to dinner, you have dozens of options, right? And so for us, what branding really means is two things. It's how do we stay in people's minds so that when they're deciding on a Friday night where to go, we're at least an option and that they pop up in their mind, hey, we're an option. And so they think about us. But two, you know, how do you associate the brand with a positive experience? And, and to me, one of the things that we've really, I think, done well with and focused on over the last five years as we've grown Titan Hospitality is to offer more than just a meal. There's a lot of good food out there. I mean, I've had some of the best meals out of a taco truck or a food truck. Sure. And there's some great little, small little Mexican restaurants that only have 30 seats that has some of the best food you've ever had. So you can get a good meal anywhere these days. For us at Titan Hospitality, we, we have said, we've asked ourselves the question of, but what else can you provide, right? Is it the decor? Is it at live entertainment on the weekends? Um, is it a happy hour that's a great offering for people? Is it a business lunch? Is it a rehearsal dinner? Is it a birthday party? The more options we can give our patrons a reason to come visit us, uh, the more they're bringing friends and guests that have never been there before. One of the reasons we love the private event business so much in our restaurants is because the two play off each other so well. You may be invited to a rehearsal dinner at the Barn and Lodge on a Saturday night with 60 people and you've never been there before. You have a great experience. You say, you know what, I'm going to bring my wife back here next weekend. Right. Or vice versa. You're in there with your wife for dinner and you look over and say, oh, wow, look at this big, beautiful private room they have where there's a private event going on. Uncle Sally's 50th birthday party is coming up. This might be a great place for us to do that. And so the two really feed off each other. But again, for us, it goes back to we've got to do more than provide a good meal. All of our competition is providing good food. We need to do it in an environment that's unique and different and inviting for people. We need to do it with live entertainment where they can stick around and have a drink after dinner and listen to some live entertainment or meet another friend after dinner. Uh, we've got to do it in a way that we have more offerings such as our Sunday brunches and our happy hours and our wine dinners that we do. And so a lot of our time at this office is spent in how do we look bigger, better uh, and, and, and more options for people than just coming in to eat dinner. Makes sense. Makes sense. Which isn't easy because yeah. everyone, everyone's trying to do that. Right? Everyone's <laughs> true, trying to figure true. that out. Have you ever thought of franchising? We have. We've had some conversations. We've had some interest from um, people who have visited our brands but live out of town and reach out to us and say, hey, I would love to open a black wall hitch in Newport, Rhode Island. Right. I'm from Newport. I'd love this restaurant. It would fit so well up here from Long Island. We're just not ready yet. You know, the franchising is a whole other world. We we are so focused on supporting our own restaurants that when you become a franchisor, you're really responsible for providing a tremendous amount of support for those restaurants in operation, whether it be marketing or human resources or operations or menu development. And I just felt at this point, we're not quite ready for that. It's something we may look into down the road, but it's a it's a different world being a franchisor. Well, I mean, I've also got to think too that I mean, let's just say the the shit hits the fan in Alexandria. You can be down there in forty five minutes sure. from here in Crofton. Yep. If something happens up at Black Backwell Barn and Lodge or up in you know future up in Baltimore County or Baltimore City or yep. Columbia, I mean, you are centrally located, and I mean, the buck does sort of stop here. Sure, we can get everywhere fast. We've got good oversight, good management. You know, we dabbled with a restaurant in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, which we we actually. Uh, split with a former partner who now runs that. But even that, as an example, you know, you're two and a half, three hours on a good day. And that's assuming the Bay Bridge isn't backed up for three right. and a half hours. And so we've had some experience with that. We are looking to expand into other states. We're, we're visiting Wilmington, Delaware a lot. We like that area. There's a lot of growth going on there. We're looking at that. You know, I think we're we're kind of cornering as we're, we, we filled up as many corners of Anne Arundel County as we can at this point. And so um, what's next? Is it is it south into Virginia? Is it north into Delaware or, or east into Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania? 
So we're going to finish out this next phase of growth, but I think it's safe to say that in our next phase in about two years, we will start looking out of state at some of those opportunities. Fantastic. Important question for me. Why is there always a parking sign that says reserved for state police and most your restaurants? You know, that actually goes <laughs> back to my days um, as a state delegate where um, we felt that at, it started at Blackwell Hitch Annapolis where we had so many elected officials and their you know executive protection details and no place to park and so they were blocking the driveway in their suvs as the governor lieutenant okay. governor or treasurer would be in the building eating dinner and i said this is a nightmare nobody can get in and out so we created a parking spot so that they could get out of the way and traffic could flow um we still deal with a tremendous amount of elected officials in our restaurants through my relationships and and when i was a former legislator and uh, and then we just decided we started doing elsewhere. We also hire uh, off-duty Maryland State Troopers to do security for us. And so it gives them an opportunity to park right there. And it also lets our customer base know that we're a safe place and we've got law enforcement around and, and you know, sends a message. Good enough. All right. Well, hey, I want to thank you so much for your time. I know uh, I've seen a ton of boxes here for <laughs> so coming in for the, the lodge in Annapolis in, that yeah. need to go someplace. We will put all the links to the show notes for all the different brands that you have. And uh, I'm excited to hear about the expansion in Columbia and Baltimore and beyond yeah. down the road. And um, we're going to touch base a little bit in a couple of months when we'll see where uh, the lodge is. Great. Well, I appreciate the time. And, and this is always fun. I love talking about the businesses and, and you do such a great job digging into the great questions. And uh, we're excited to get these restaurants open and have you come try some of the food. Well, I'll be glad to give you my money. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thanks for listening to this week's Local Business Spotlight. Please make sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinion. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you all the day's local news direct to your phone, tablet, or computer in about 10 minutes. It comes to you at 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.